morning, church. How many of you had a good Christmas? I hadn't seen y'all since last year, I think. <laughs> Been a while. Did you have a good Christmas? Yeah. Good, I'm glad that you did. Well, I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, we're starting a new series this morning, and it's uh, entitled All In. And the title of the message this morning is God Has Called Me to Set a Good Example. God Has Called Me to set a good example. Let's all stand again, if you would, and open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, I want to read verse 12 right now. Keep your Bibles open to this passage. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up the whole body. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have given us a system, your divine system, in which you would have your church function. And Lord, I pray that today we will recognize and realize more than ever before that every one of us matters in your family. And what we do for you matters. It makes a difference. So Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to each and every one of us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. I know it was on the video, but I want to reiterate what it said. Nine out of every ten churches in America in America, are either declining or growing at a rate slower than the population is growing. Now think about that. 90% of churches, that's all denominations, are either declining or growing at a rate that they're never going to keep up with the population of their communities. Now I don't know about you, but that makes me very, very concerned for the church in the future. Sometimes I wonder because of what God has called me to do, I wonder these young ministers that are coming in to the ministry today, what the church is going to look like to them 20 years from now or 30 years or 40 years from now. Because I can promise you, unless God intervenes, it's going to look radically different. In fact, it reminds me of what you would see over in England when you would go to churches that used to be filled to the brim and now they're ghost towns. Went into one church over there that would seat 1,000 people, and they averaged 30 to 35 people every single Sunday. That's all. America is headed that way unless God gives us revival. And how many of you would agree this morning that America needs revival? We certainly do. Now I want to share with you something. 67% of the builder generation, what's the builder generation? Those that are born between 1925 and 1945, 67% of those say and identify themselves as Christians, 67%. If you're part of that group, why don't you stand up? If you're born between 25 and 45, would you stand? Amen. Now keep standing. You guys are the ones who built this country. You are the ones that put your hand to the plow. You are the ones that made a difference. You are the ones who stood on the ideals of our Constitution and Bill of Rights and made this country what it is with the blessings of God. Amen? 67% of your generation says we identify as Christian. Thank you. Please be seated. Now I want another group to stand. It may not have very many in this service. We had a bunch in the early service. That's the millennials. Those are born in 1982 or later. If you were born in 1982, would you stand? Don't be lying in church now. All right, we've got a bunch in here. Good. Good for you guys. Amen. Now keep standing. Now I want to point out something. We're going to go from 67% of a generation that says we identify as Christian. This group right here, generally speaking, in the United States of America, 15%. Identify as believers. 15%. Do you millennials see that we got a lot of work to do reaching your generation? We have got to stop playing church and start reaching out in the name of Jesus and turn this country around for God. Thank you. Please be seated. It's been said the first generation dreams it, the next generation builds it, the next generation, the third, enjoys it, the fourth one, condemns it, and the fifth one gives it away. Where do you see America? I think we might be generation number five because we have all these who've been raised today that they don't understand our history, 
something we don't even teach in our public schools anymore, in a lot of them. And they don't understand the struggles that we went through, and they don't understand what it took to get here, and they've enjoyed an easy life all their life. They've never known hardship. And as a result of that, they're just condemning it, and they're knocking it, and they're ready to give it away. Now, again, church attendance of all denominations is declining. Even, even those that say that they're seeker churches are declining now. Those of you who are 65 years of age and up, please stand. You didn't know you were going to be in an interactive sermon today, did you? <laughs> now, this, this is funny because it's exactly flip-flop in the early service, you know. 65 of years of age or older, some of you ladies say, I'm not standing. <laughs> I'm not telling him how old I am. Now, look around you. Today, today, 24%. Of people in your age group, 24% attend church once a week. Get this, 15% of people in your age group never go to church. Never. Now, did you hear that? Only 24% of your generation attends church on an average out of a month one time. That's, that's amazing. Please be seated. If you're in the age group 50 to 64, please stand. Look around you. 28% of the people in your age group attend church once a week. Only 28% of the people in your age group attend church one time a week. And 24% of the people in your age group, get that, 24%, almost one out of every four, never, ever go to church. So it's going from 15% to 24%. Thank you. Please be seated. If you're from the age of 30 to 49, please stand. 30 to 49. Now, one thing I would say that, I, that, that really blesses me as a pastor, we can see that we're multi-generational, can't we? I like that. Now, you look around. 32%. You guys win. 32% attend church once a week. But 68% don't go once a week. Isn't that amazing? Now get this. 35%, yeah, you lose. 35% of people in your age group never go to church. Never in America. Any church, any denomination. Thank you. Please be seated. Got one more. If you're between the ages of 18 and 29, stand please. 18 and 29. 17% of your generation goes to church once a week, 17%. Now think about that for just a moment. 17% and 26% of your generation never goes to church ever in their life. Thank you. Please be seated. Folks, we need revival. The church in America is in desperate trouble. And if we don't have a God-sent revival, I don't know what the church or even if it's going to be around or much of it, it might be a shell of what it used to be in another 20 years or 30 years or so. Now, here's my point. You think, well, Pastor, this is a real downer. Here's the application. We can't control what other churches do. I can't control what other preachers preach about, and I shouldn't have that control. They hopefully will preach what God leads them to preach, but we have a lot of shallow preaching going on today. I will say that. And a lot of unbiblical preaching going on. I can't control that. You can't control what any other church does. But brothers and sisters, we can control what we do. And that is our hope. Let's thank the Lord. We can do that. <clears throat> what that means for us is that you and I can set a good example to this community. We can be faithful to the Lord. We can make a difference. How many of you think that Spring Baptist Church ought to be a lighthouse for this community? We should be. The question is, are we going to be? We have been in the past, and I think we are now. But, folks, if things continue in the vein that they're going in, and the church at large is in desperate trouble, and the church at large is not a lighthouse for anyone anymore. But we can be if we want to. The problem is, or the question is, do we want to? 
Do we desire to be that which God has called us to be, a shining beacon for the Lord Jesus Christ to the lostness and the darkness of the community in which we live? That's our calling. Now I've got a couple of questions for you. First of all, I have to ask the question, am I a part of the church body? Am I a part of the church body? Leads me to another question. How does one become a part of the church? Do you think, well, pastor, that's so rudimentary. That's so elementary. Everybody knows that. Uh Uh-uh. Not everybody knows that anymore. I guarantee you there are people in this room right now that do not know how to become a part of a local church. So I want to tell you this morning. One of the ways that you can become a part of the local church is by joining it. But how do you do that? Look at verse 12. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all, how many of us? Been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Now, the first act is to join the kingdom of God. What does that mean? It means that I'm in my life. There's a point where the Holy Spirit of God convicts me that I'm a sinner, unclean, and undone, and I can't save myself. And I recognize and realize that I need a Savior. And by faith, I turn to Jesus Christ, God's perfect Son, the perfect sacrifice. And I say, Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for me. And I want you to forgive me of my sins. And I receive you as Savior and Lord of my life. When you do that, you instantly become a part of God's family. Did you know there are Christians in almost every denomination? Not all of them, but almost. Did you know that the Catholic Church even has some Christians? Did you know that Methodists, there's some Christians in the Methodist Church? This will blow your mind. Did you know that there are even some Christians in the Baptist Church? So I get saved, I invite Christ into my heart, and I become immediately and instantly a part of the kingdom of God. But how do I join the local church? And what is the need for it? Well, one of the ways that I join, a person can join the local church, they get saved, and then they say, I want to follow the Lord in baptism. And so they are biblically baptized. What does that mean? It means if you've been sprinkled or poured on, you were not biblically baptized. That's what it means. What does it mean to be biblically baptized? How was Jesus baptized? John the Baptist, who baptized Jesus? John the what? Not the Methodist. (laughs) Actually, it just means John the Baptizer, okay? And so John the Baptizer took Jesus and he put him underneath the water, which was foretelling that one day Jesus would die for the sins of the world, be buried in a borrowed tomb, and three days later he would rise up out of the grave. You can't tell that story by being sprinkled. You can't tell that story by being poured on. The biblical way to be baptized is by immersion. If you've not been baptized by immersion, completely plunged underneath the water, and that's what the word baptizo means, to be completely covered with water. That's what it means. If you've not been baptized that way, you have not been scripturally baptized. And it matters. There's another way that you can join the church, and that's by letter. Something we don't hear much about anymore. And I know some would say, what does that mean? That means that you come here and you walk down the aisle and you say, I want to join your church. Well, are you a Christian? Yes, I've been saved and I've been baptized and I'm a member of such and such church. So what we do is we write such and such church and we ask them for your records and they mail your records to us. That's how you join by letter. Does that make sense? Okay. And there's another way. We join by statement. What does that mean? I like to join this church. I'm not coming from a Baptist background, but I am coming from a denomination that is of like faith and order. Very same kinds of principles, biblical beliefs. I'm coming from that. I've been baptized by immersion, and I want to join this church. Or you might say, I, the church I used to attend burned to the ground. They don't have any records left. So can you trust me? I'm telling you with a statement that i like to join. And the answer is, yes, we will trust you. If you want to join by statement, you can join that way. So you can join by baptism, by letter, or by statement, the local church. And it's important that you become a member of a local church. Why? 
Because in that way, you can count on us and we can count on you. We know who you are. We've got you in a, enrolled in a, a Sunday school class or a small group or a life group, whatever you want to call it. You're enrolled and, and the people there love you and they're going to take care of you. And that's where you find your home. That's where you find your network of friends is in a small group. And it's important that you be a part of a small group so you can journey through life together. And it's always better to journey through life with someone than all by yourself. Amen? we got a bunch of loners out there this morning. Don't you agree it's, it's good to go through life with someone? It is. Now, it's a personal choice. You cannot get saved through osmosis. You say, preacher, I must be saved. I'm an American. Well, if you were born in a garage, would that make you an automobile? If you were born in an oven, would that make you a biscuit? Just because you were born in America does not mean that you are a Christian. It doesn't mean that. It's a personal decision where I say, God, I need your son in my heart. I need your forgiveness. I believe you. I trust you. I know Jesus died for me, and I receive him as my Savior, my Lord. You do that, and then you're born into the family of God. You're saved when? When you confess Christ as Savior and Lord. Now, a lot of people want Jesus as Savior because they want fire insurance. I want to know that when I die, I'm not going to go to hell. So I want to get saved so I won't go to hell, but I'm still going to come to church when I feel like it. I'll pray when I feel like it. I won't when I don't feel like it. I'll read the Bible when I feel like it. I'll witness if I feel like it. I'll give if I feel like it. If I don't, I just won't do it. And so we go through this journey right here of saying, okay, I want fire insurance, but I'm not going to let Jesus be the Lord of my life. What's the word Lord mean? He's your boss. How many of you know that Jesus is the boss? Yeah. You know, And we as believers are supposed to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit and the example of the living Lord Jesus Christ that he has set for us. And in that way, we become the example that this world needs. Now, here's something that Baptists believe that a lot of other denominations do not believe. And I'm glad we believe this. Here's what we believe. If you've been born into the family of God, he is your heavenly father, and you are his child, and there is nothing that can separate that relationship. Amen. Nothing. Do we have a, a kid in here? Do we have any kids in here? Where at? Come on up here. Can you come up here with me? What's her name? Sarah? Okay, Daddy, come with her. Come with her. She's thinking, I wanted to, but now that I've got to actually have the choice, I'm not sure about this. <laughs> Come on up here. How old is Sarah? <laughs> I'm not going to hurt you, I promise, Sarah. I'm, I like kids. I love children. Come on up here. How old are you, Sarah? 16? Six years old. You're the same age, almost the same age as my granddaughter, right? Now, tell me your name. Caitlin, okay, Caitlin, I'm sorry. Caitlin, Sarah grows up, and she's naughty. Will she still be your daughter? Uh, this wasn't part of what I planned. <laughs> yes, she will, right? If she does a lot of bad things as a teenage girl, is she still going to be your daughter? Yes. Yes. And if she winds up, God forbid, if she winds up doing something so bad, she winds up in jail one day, will she still be your daughter? Yeah. Yeah. So what you're saying is, are you, are you and her going to be getting along if that happens? You'll still, you'll still love her. Why? Because she is your, she's your daughter. But you're probably not going to be getting along if she's doing a lot of bad things because it hurts you, right? So here's what we're saying. She can break fellowship with you, but she can never break relationship with you. You will always be her mother. She will always be your daughter. Amen? Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So here's the application. Have any of you ever done anything wrong after you got saved? Raise your hand. If the person next to you has done a whole lot wrong, raise both hands. Okay. All right? So 
Are you and God, when you're disobeying God, you're not walking with God like you should? Are you and God in good fellowship? No. But does that mean he's no longer your heavenly father? Not at all. We believe that if you've been born again, you are always a part of God's family. You may stray from God. You may do some things wrong. You may disobey God, and you might do it on purpose. But God still loves you, and you're still his child. And the Holy Spirit will always beckon your heart to come back. Aren't you thankful for that? I'm very thankful for that. Here's the second thing. Lord, help me get through this sermon, all right? Here's the second thing. Another question. What is my role in the church? I want all of us to ask that together. What is my role in the church? Okay. Every believer is a part of the whole. Every believer. It says in verse 14, yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. I'm assuming that probably all of us came to church in a car, an automobile this morning. Maybe there's somebody that walked but a, or rode a bike, but probably 99.9% .9 of us came to church in some kind of an automobile and we got here. And here's the thing about a car. A car has a lot of different parts, doesn't it? And when all the parts are doing what they're supposed to do, the car runs and you can get where you want to go, right? We'll see here in a moment the writer makes some great application concerning this. But can you imagine if the alternator, you're trying to start the car, and the alternator says, you know, I don't like being an alternator. I want to be a radiator. And the radiator says, you know, I don't really like being a radiator. I want to be a spark plug. Can you imagine that conversation going on with the different parts of your car? See, they all have unique different responsibilities, so to speak, different things they were designed to do, and when they all do those things that they're designed to do, your car runs. Have you ever gotten in your car and turned the key and you hear, Wah! and the battery's dead? When you do that, do you just say, praise Jesus? Because <laughs> a battery is designed to start the car, Right? And when it doesn't do its job, the car can't run. It can't function. It won't start. It won't go anywhere. It won't move anywhere. Every part of the car, the automobile, has a job. Here's the application. When every church member does their job, the church functions like it's supposed to function. And if any of us, any of us fail to do our job, we're not going to be that well-oiled machine that God's called us to be. There's going to be a weak link in there somewhere. There's going to be something missing, a part of ministry that's not there because someone somewhere chose to not do what God told them to do. But if we all say, yes, I understand I'm a part of the whole, the church, and I want to do what God's called me to do, it's a glorious thing. It's a wonderful thing when God's people do what God has called them to do. So look at this. Every believer is placed by God. In verse 15, if the foot says, I'm not part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. So all of it's orchestrated by God. Do you see that? He's put each part right where he wants it. Verse 19, how strange a body would be if it only had one part. Can you imagine just a giant eyeball up here this morning? Just a big old eyeball, and I communicate to you by blinking. Can you imagine that? Yes, there are many parts but only how many bodies so imagine this about the human body what if it was just one big eyeball how would you hear what, what could you imagine if if your if your ear said you know I'm just going to be I want the whole body to be an ear how would you smell anything can you imagine going for lunch and they set down some the Baptist bird which is fried chicken and you say let me smell that Because they all have unique, 
individual parts to play that make the human body function like it's supposed to function. Can you imagine if the, if the body were just one gigantic glutamus maximus? <laughs> Somebody said, I'm going to Google that. You'll be surprised if you don't. Know. Did you know there's sometimes in churches that there are people that say, I believe that God has called me to be the glutamus maximus of this church. Or somebody else says, I believe God's called me to be the pain in the glutamus maximus. Now have you figured out what it is? We all have it. I would hate to sit down with that one though, wouldn't you? And some of us have been especially blessed in that area. Put this under the category, things I never thought I'd hear a preacher say. <laughs> all the bodies made up of different parts, but they're all necessary. Amen? All of them. Every member is vital. Verse 21. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest or, and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen. While the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that an extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. So what that means is that God has called every one of us to a specific spiritual role in the church and your role matters and your role is important because no one can do what God has called you to do. Amen. You're needed here. you got to plug in. you got to exercise the spiritual gift that God has given you. Notice verse 22. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. You know, when I woke up this morning, the first thought I had is, I wonder how my liver's doing today. <laughs> Have you ever thought that? <laughs> yeah. Did you get up this morning and think, I wonder how my nostrils are? No, you just assume they're going to work, do what they're supposed to do, design what they were designed to do, and you got it. You didn't even give it a thought. But can you live without a liver? Can you live without nostrils? You have to have them, right? you got to have that. So when you don't fulfill your calling, it hurts the whole body. Not just you, because you're missing out on the blessings of God when you don't do what God's called you to do. But it hurts the whole body when you aren't functioning. Do you understand that, how important this is, and why God took such pain to, to, through Paul to write this down so we could get a grasp on how important we are to God and the calling that he's placed on our life? You know, when you got in your car this morning, you turned the key, you didn't for a moment think, I wonder how my spark plugs are, unless you're a little weird. You didn't think that, not for a moment. You're just glad that they do their job. I'm thankful that my spark plugs did their job this morning. I'm glad my battery did its job this morning. Car won't run without them, and a church can't run without the people who've been called by God to do certain things. We need everyone. Now, folks, listen to me. Listen clearly. You can't fulfill the role that God has called you to if you aren't here. If you're hit and miss, and God's called you to, to serve him in the local church, over 90% of the time when the word church is mentioned in the Bible, it's speaking of a specific local church. You can't do what God's called you to do if you're hit and miss and you're not coming. You can't do what God's called you to do if you're not committed to the Lord. And we all need to be committed to the Lord. You may not have a glamorous role. You might even sometimes think, well, I'm not really that needed, but you are. The older I get, the more I thank God for Sunday school teachers and leaders and, and men who get up early on Saturday morning and cook breakfast for the other men and, and uh, at, men's, at the men's breakfast and child care workers and, and worship guide folders and greeters out there and in the, the orchestra. I thank God for all these because they're all an integral part of this church that makes it function. You thank God for them. Let's thank the Lord. Here's the last thing. These are three common roles of every church member. There are three things that every church member must do. Number one, promote unity. Can we all say that together? Verse 25 says, this makes for harmony among the members. 
when there is mutual submission one to the other, when we all understand what God has called us to do, and there's no jealousy involved, there's no aggravation. You know, don't you just get tired of it when people say, well, if I did that, this is the way I would do it. How about you just let the person do it that was called to do it, and you do what God calls you to do. Amen? Wouldn't we all be better off if we quit? complaining and griping. I mean, I'm talking about the church at large. Of course, this church has never been a negative word said in this church. <laughs> Would we all be better off if we were optimistic and supporters of one another? Amen. Look at the person next to you. Say, I support you. And then you tell them back. Second thing, show love and care. Say that together. Verse 25, so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. When one of us hurts, we ought to all hurt. We ought to care. And when one of us has a blessing, a special blessing, we shouldn't be jealous of that blessing. We should rejoice. In fact, I am absolutely 100% convinced that God will never bless you beyond your ability to rejoice when he blesses somebody else. You hear what I'm saying? So when one of us hurts, we all hurt. When one of us rejoices, we all rejoice. Have you ever slammed your, your finger or thumb in a, in a car door? You ever done that? Or let, let me ask, have you ever hit it with a hammer? Okay. Here's what it means. I'm out in the garage. Let's say I'm doing two things at the same time. I'm hammering and I'm dancing. Aren't you glad I'm not a dancer anyway? <laughs> so I'm hammering along. My feet are just dancing along, and I went, bam, oh, my thumb. And my feet say, well, thumb, I sure am sorry you're hurting, but I'm going to keep on dancing. <laughs> Doesn't work. Your whole body's involved, right? I mean, you hurt your thumb. It's like all attention is on your thumb. One of the things I love about Spring Baptist Church is we care for one another. I can't tell you the number of times I've gone to make a hospital call and can't get in the room because so many of our church folk are there praying, taking care of each other. I mean that you guys cook meals for each other. You go and pray with one another. You mow each other's lawn. You'll do laundry for each other. I've been thinking about faking sick, so y'all come do some of that for me. <laughs> we take care of each other. and That's what a family's about. Amen. And when one of us hurts, we ought to hurt for them. Genuinely hurt for them. And when one is rejoicing, we ought to rejoice with them. When somebody tells you something good that's happened in their family, praise the Lord for it. Don't be envious or jealous of it. Here's the last thing. Be involved. Verse 27. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. So the whole can't function if the parts aren't working. What if next Sunday you, you came to church and every, if, you, if you're a Sunday school teacher, raise your hand right now. Hold it real high. Wave your hand at me, all right? Wave your hand at me. Can you imagine if they were out front and they're picketing? We're on strike. We're not going to teach today because we have not been getting enough accolades, enough praise, and enough honor. So we're striking until people start praising us and honoring us because we deserve it. And they're just marching around the church holding their signs. They don't do that because they serve the Lord. Amen. That's why they do it. God called them to do it. And we ought to make sure, you ought to make sure next Sunday when you walk into Sunday school class, if you haven't told your teacher, director, hey, I want you to know something. I appreciate you. I appreciate the lessons you bring. We ought to rejoice with them and thank them and have a, a heart full of gratitude because they serve us diligently. Can you imagine? Amen. Let's thank them. Can you imagine if you went to drop your kids off or grandkids off back in the, the preschool nursery area back there, and, and, and then all of a sudden the, the teacher said, hey, we're not taking any kids today because we're on strike. You've got people right now that are back there with our kids and our grandchildren that are rocking them and singing to them and reading them a Bible story and changing a dirty diaper. Because they love Jesus. And they deserve appreciation. Amen. I thank God 
for every one of you. For every single one of you. You are a blessing to me. And I thank you for serving the Lord and loving Jesus with abandon. I thank you for the times that you've come up to me and encouraged me as your pastor. You've made a difference in my life. Thank you, brother. I love you, Mark. Love you. I had to give him $20 to say that. I love Monty. He's a good guy. 